It's 10 o'clock. This is Sky News at 10, our top story. Russia says four gunmen have been captured after more than 130 people were killed in an attack on a concert hall in Moscow. All those who planned and executed this operation will be punished. Whoever directed them, we will identify everyone responsible and will punish all of them. The Princess of Wales thanks people around the world for their messages after revealing she's being treated for cancer. Attention now turns to Prince William, who will continue his public duties while supporting his family. Also tonight, a special report from Haiti, where gang violence has brought chaos to the country. We're at the presidential palace where we were there yesterday, and now there's a full-on gun battle going on. You drive down a road and suddenly cars start turning around and going the other way, and you know that it's getting dangerous. A candlelight vigil in Hull as relatives affected by the investigation of a funeral home remember their loved ones. And Sven's dream comes true as the former England boss becomes Liverpool manager for the day. And we'll take a first look at tomorrow's front pages in our press preview from 10.30. Good evening. It's the worst terror attack Moscow has seen in two decades. More than 130 people have been killed when gunmen opened fire on concert goers enjoying a gig on a Friday night. Russian authorities say all those responsible have been detained. Islamic State says it was behind this devastating attack. Our international correspondent John Sparks has the details and the warning his report does contain distressing images. There's not much left of Croker City Concert Hall, where fans of a veteran rock band had gathered to see a show. The seats have been destroyed, the auditorium filled with chunks of metal, a stage exposed to the open air. Now members of the emergency services comb the wreckage, looking for victims of the attack. Spontaneous memorials have appeared throughout the Russian capital, one forming here, near the entrance of the ruin complex. The authorities say they've caught four gunmen responsible for the incident. A massacre that's been claimed by Islamic State. But in a televised address, the Russian president suggested Ukraine was to blame. All those who shot and killed people were found and detained. They tried to hide and were moving towards Ukraine, where, according to preliminary data, a passage was prepared for them on the Ukrainian side to cross the state border. It is a major embarrassment for the country's strongman president. His imposing security infrastructure has failed to protect city residents. The gunman, clad in camouflage, gained access to the concert hall with automatic rifles, explosives and flammable liquids. Their operation was organized and ruthless, shooting unarmed civilians at point-blank range. Fueled by fear, the audience rushed for the exit, pushing, shoving, trying to barge their way out. But there were too many people in the auditorium. Calmly, calmly, says one. Exit that way, to the top, shouts another. When I looked at the line of fire, I saw that they were not shooting at the ceiling, not into the air, but shooting directly into the crowd of people who were in the front rows of the Crocus concert hall. This is the VIP zone, the first rows. The first, these blocks of seats, there was a crowd of people there. These were not some scattered groups of people or a few people, but it was just a crowd of people that were being shot at. I just can't imagine the scale of the disaster. In these images, people hurry past lifeless bodies sprawled on the floor. Streaks of blood mark the reception area. And the situation at Crocus City was deteriorating. The gunman had set the building on fire. Russian television has aired footage of four men the authorities accuse of carrying out the attack. This man, who doesn't seem to speak much Russian, is alleged to be the ringleader. Another seven have been detained. 
it is a monstrous incident that's left many in Moscow feeling vulnerable. In response, the Russian government will act aggressively. John Sparks, Sky News. Well, investigations have begun to establish how the perpetrators managed to carry out their attack and escape in a car before being detained. Our international correspondent Ivor Bennett examines what we know so far about how the attack was carried out. Security has been one of the central pillars of Vladimir Putin's presidency, and the embarrassment felt by this attack means it could have ramifications that spread beyond Russia's borders. But how did it happen? The target was an entertainment complex on the outskirts of Moscow in the northwest suburb of Krasnogorsk. It was just before 8 o'clock on Friday night and the auditorium at Crocus City Hall was filling up. People had come to see a rock concert by a Soviet-era band called Picnic. We have a satellite image of the overall complex and we've marked on where it's likely the attackers entered on the right-hand side here. We'll come to how they moved through the arena shortly. But first, let's look at the floor plans of the auditorium itself. It has three tiers, a capacity of 6,200, and this event was sold out. Not everyone was in their seats when the attack began. The concert hadn't started, and the first victims were actually targeted outside in the foyer. Now, together with videos taken on the ground, we can see the attacker's route. The gunman entered the foyer in the bottom corner there, and they immediately started shooting. We then see them crossing the striped marble, marble floor as they head towards the auditorium. And the next video shows them moving together, spraying bullets as they go. Although we don't know their exact route, we then do know the attackers made their way into the main concert hall. And it's here we see them moving between the rows of seats, shooting victims at point blank range. Today, the governor of the Moscow region visited the site with investigators. He was filmed walking through into the stall section of the theatre. And it's in this video we really understand the true scale of the destruction. It's laid bare. The fire that engulfed the complex and caused some of the roof to collapse has left a burnt-out shell. Russia says it detained four suspects in the Bryansk region of the country, which is around four hours away from Moscow. It also borders Belarus and Ukraine. We also have an image of what is reportedly the car the suspects were travelling in uh, when they were stopped. The Kremlin claims they were heading to Ukraine, hoping to cross the border, but Kiev has denied any involvement in the attack. So while we can tell you how the attack unfolded, the question of who's to blame is disputed. Well, the branch of Islamic State has claimed responsibility for the Moscow attack. ISIS-K has frequently criticised Vladimir Putin and the Kremlin over Russian involvement in places like Syria. Our international affairs editor Dominic Waghorn reports. <laughs> if Islamic State was behind this outrage, it might seem strange to many. One of the West's arch enemies attacking another. But Islamists have hated Russia for decades. As far back as 2002, Chechen Islamists were behind the Moscow theatre siege that left hundreds dead. Then two years later, the Bezlan school siege claimed hundreds more Russian lives. Putin is despised by Islamists for Chechnya and Syria, where his air force helped the Assad regime crush Islamic State and kill many Muslims. ISIS and its affiliates uh, see Russia as a bitter enemy. Uh, Russia's Putin intervention in Syria in 2015 really turned the tide against the Syrian opposition, uh, including ISIS, and basically saved President Bashar al-Assad now. Islamic State has claimed responsibility for this, but even so, Moscow is blaming Ukraine instead. The style of terrorist attack very much differ uh, from the style of Islamists, so they, they are not Islamists. I am 99% uh, uh, sure that Ukrainian authorities uh, took part in organizing of this terrorist attack. But Kyiv and most serious observers are rejecting any Ukrainian involvement in this attack. The Kremlin itself has some awkward questions to answer. Why did it dismiss out of hand Western warnings issued two weeks ago an attack by extremists in Moscow was imminent? And why did it reportedly take an hour and a half for security forces to arrive at the scene of the concert massacre? If the Russian state wasn't behind this attack, did it at least let it happen? 
we've been expecting for some time the Kremlin to look for an excuse to step up its efforts to recruit people, to drag them into the armed forces. They've been resisting open mobilization for some time, and it's been anticipated that with Russia's manpower needs because of the horrendous casualties they've been taking on the front line, sooner or later, they'll be looking for some kind of more widespread mobilization or conscription. So there is a lot of speculation at the moment that this may in fact provide the excuse for Russia to actually step up the war rhetoric as if it were possible to make it even more strident at home and provide an excuse for dragging more people into the armed forces. In any other country, the idea the state could in some way be implicated in this would be absurd. But the Putin regime has shown no qualms about slaughtering innocent civilians. And the fact it is in any way plausible speaks volumes about the state of Russia under his rule. And Dominic joins me now in the studio. So, Dominic, a lot of speculation in Russia about possible links between this attack and Ukraine. But what do you think this will actually mean for the war in Ukraine itself? Yeah, a lot of speculation, a lot of conspiracy theories tonight, both inside Russia and outside of Russia. Outside of Russia. Lots of sort of um, speculation about Russia's possible involvement. And I think that arises from the fact that it, it, it looked like it was letting this happen. It was warned two weeks ago this is a possibility, did seem, didn't seem to do anything about it. And then when the attack was happening for an hour and a half, no one was sent to the aid of these poor Russian civilians being being, being killed. Um, but I think what's more important, putting, putting that aside, is actually what the Kremlin is saying, or what people related to the Kremlin are saying, people like Sergei Markov there, which is that this um, was not Islamic State's res uh, responsibility. They have claimed responsibility, but the Russians are saying, through various mouthpieces and evidence they're putting forward, that this was the Ukrainians' Uh, behind this. Now, no one's taking that seriously, I don't think, outside of Russia. I think most people are accepting Islamic State is the most likely culprit. They say they did it, and tonight they've produced a, a video of it, which will be more compelling evidence implicating them, of course, self-implicating. But I think the Kremlin's aim is not to convince people outside of Russia. It's for domestic consumption. Russia at the moment is, it looks like it's scaling up for a more escalated campaign um, in Ukraine. It, for the first time, we've had the Kremlin referring to this special military operation, as it's been referring to it up to now, as a war, saying that Russia is in a state of war. Um, it seems to be softening up the Russians for the possibility of another mobilisation. And I think this is all playing into that, potentially. Putin is a past master at taking events, whether he's designed them to happen or not, but using them and manipulating them to suit his narrative, to suit his ends. And to say that the Ukrainians are behind this, I think he'll be using to persuade the Russians, who he's frankly terrified throughout this war, saying that he's the only person standing between um, Russia and Western domination at the hands of NATO and Ukraine. He's terrifying them further, I think, by using this attack, whether Russia was involved in it in any way or not. So it's clearly, I think, a sign that uh, Russia is going to be get, getting more involved in Ukraine, uh, which is obviously more cat catastrophe for the Ukrainians and for the Russians. More than 300,000 Russians have uh, been killed or injured uh, in this war. So I think the fear is, in the minds of Ukrainians and their Western allies, that this tragedy this massacre in, in Moscow will be used to justify yet more bloodshed in Ukraine. Yeah, a worrying development. Dominic Waghorn, our international affairs editor. Dom, thank you. Now, the Princess of Wales has tonight said she has received messages of support from right around the world after revealing she's being treated for cancer. In a statement, she said she and William were extremely moved by the public's warmth and support. Our royal correspondent, Rhiannon Mills, reports. As a family, they've been used to stepping into the spotlight. This is one moment when all the princess wants to do is protect her children from it. As the world processes the news of her cancer diagnosis, her message about the importance of family could not have been any stronger. This, of course, came as a huge shock. And William and I have been doing everything we can to process and manage this privately for the sake of our young family. As I've said to them, I am well and getting stronger every day by focusing on the things that will help me heal in my mind, body and spirits. Having William by my side is a great source of comfort and reassurance too. For everyone facing this disease, in whatever form, please do not lose faith or hope. You are not alone. A particularly poignant phrase that's been compared to Queen Elizabeth's rallying speech during COVID when she used those words we'll meet again. From this future queen, there is no sense of resentment after what must have been a gruelling few weeks. The social media speculation of Kate Gate now replaced by an outpouring of love and sympathy 
with messages from around the world and acknowledgement of her incredible international status. With affection for her also on display closer to home in Windsor. She has lots of sympathy from us all and um, yes, it was just shocking. She should never have been put in a situation where she had to speak out like that. She should be allowed some privacy. We're very fond of Kate. We think she's wonderful. Yeah. And uh, so, but we wish her the best. In a statement, a Kensington Palace spokesperson said, the prince and princess are both enormously touched by the kind messages from people here in the UK, across the Commonwealth and around the world in response to Her Royal Highness's message. They are extremely moved by the public's warmth and support and are grateful for the understanding of their request for privacy at this time. Throughout her diagnosis and her treatment, Prince William has been by Kate's side. And her, it seems, always in his thoughts as he's tried to keep going with his engagements. Going solo, something he's going to have to get used to for some time to come. Tessie Ojo was with William for the Diana Awards less than a couple of weeks ago. She's known him for the past 24 years and says his resilience is remarkable. It gives you a sense of how much they continues so how much service means to them you know how he shows up how they show up you know despite all of the stuff that's happening he may be heir to the throne but prince william like so many partners helping their loved ones in this kind of situation is probably feeling a bit helpless after all it's mainly up to the doctors what happens in the short term but one thing i know he feels he can do at the moment is really double down when it comes to trying to protect his family's privacy. It is Kate's response and decision to tell us herself that has been particularly striking. A devoted mother wanting to do the best for her family, her inner strength really coming to the fore. Rhiannon Mills, Sky News. With both King Charles and now the Princess of Wales away from full-time engagements, Prince William and other members of the family are having to shoulder more of the burden. Our Home Affairs editor Jason Farrow looks at the constitutional issues that an already slimmed-down monarchy is facing. The show must go on. For the Irish Guards changing duties with the Welsh, it was business as usual at the castle. And the palace says, constitutionally, the same is true for the royals. Despite his diagnosis, the king is still holding audiences with dignitaries. But he's stepped back from public-facing engagements. And there's a sense of frailty in the royal household. With two key figures unwell, these are unsettling times. It's very, very difficult, obviously, because um, you know, the, and unsettling because this is an institution that, that's based on, on stability and continuity. So you have two key players who are going to be out of action for some time. Um, and it's doubly difficult because they're having their health issues discussed in such a public way. The late Queen had to step up when her father got cancer. She famously said, I need to be seen to be believed how true that was of Princess Catherine. And although she's answered the conspiracy theories with a sobering truth, she won't be back in the public eye until medics say she's fit to go. And William will be with her, at least for the Easter break. Clearly, there's a lot on Prince William's shoulders. His wife and father with cancer. His brother abroad and, to some degree, estranged. His uncle Andrew relieved of his duties. There's a dwindling pool of big-hitting royals available to help hold the fort. My husband is so sorry that he cannot be with us today. His stepmother is a key player. Queen Camilla delivered a speech written by the king on his behalf on the Isle of Man this week. And next week, she'll play his role at the Maunday Easter service in Worcester. Of course, one feature is that um, there has been a slimming down, and so there has been more emphasis on a smaller number of royals. And so when two are out of action, um, you know, that is perhaps a bigger issue than it might have been. The remaining support team, the Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh and Princess Anne, a stalwart of public engagements, are likely to have more focus on them. And even Prince Andrew was leading the family at a recent memorial service when William needed to be with Catherine. It's a test of resilience for the royals, but they hope 
This is only a temporary changing of the guard. Jason Farrell, Sky News. Gang violence has continued to escalate in Haiti as heavily armed criminal groups try to take control of the capital city. Thousands have been forced to leave their homes and the unrest is causing food shortages. Our chief correspondent, Stuart Ramsey, is in Port-au-Prince. Well, the gang violence can flare up in different places at any given time. And when it does, it means that whole communities basically have to lock down. It means that shops are shut so people don't get food. There's a petrol station up here. There's queues that can last hours when they're open. See the police on the streets occasionally. What we've noticed today, though, is one, bodies on street corners. Who's killed them? Some locals say it was police. Others say it's gang members. We were at the presidential palace where we were there yesterday, and now there's a full-on gun battle going on. You drive down a road and suddenly cars start turning around and going the other way, and you know that it's getting dangerous. That's the situation in, in Haiti right now. Now, the hope is that a national council will take over running of the country and set new election dates, but there is nothing to indicate when they're going to sit. Added to that, that the gangs have already said that they are not going to cooperate and they're threatening violence against any of the politicians who take part. So, Haiti at the moment is stuck in this sort of chaotic, not moving in any direction and continuing violence which seems to be getting worse. A vigil has taken place in Hull for the relatives of people affected by a police investigation into a funeral directors in the city. 35 bodies were recovered from sites belonging to legacy independent funeral directors earlier this month after concerns were raised about the storage and management of bodies. Sky's Charlotte Leeming reports. Honouring their loved ones with a private vigil at the historic Hullminster, a service for the many families affected by the legacy funeral director's investigation. We wanted to find a kind of safe and private place that people could come together to find solace with each other and to honour their lost loved ones. What we want to do is provide dignity and honour to those that we've lost and to each other as we grieve. The vigil involving prayer, reflection and the lighting of candles, bringing dozens of people together. It was beautiful, emotional, though, seeing all the people, it's heartbreaking. Like, I just spoke to a lady then and I said, if I don't ever find my dad's ashes or my brother's at his, he's still at rest, isn't he? Just because I ain't got him, he's still happy. So she's reassured me a little bit there, so I feel a little bit better. That's so important, people feeling they're not alone with this. There's, there's very sadly, lots of other people in the community are struggling as well, and I, I hope that tonight will offer them that, that comfort and that sense of togetherness. Police say this is a sensitive and complex investigation with more than 1,500 people calling a dedicated helpline with concerns about the funeral home where 35 bodies were recovered. Two people arrested as part of the inquiry have been released on bail. Detectives have asked people to be patient as they follow up extensive lines of inquiry. In a time of confusion and loss, the vigil has brought those affected together whilst they wait for the answers they so desperately want. Charlotte Lee Ming, Sky News, Hull. Richard Taylor, whose 10-year-old son, Damilola, was murdered in South London, has died following a long illness. 75-year-old Mr. Taylor campaigned against gang violence in the capital after his son was murdered as he walked home from the local library. The former civil servant also worked to improve the lives of disadvantaged children. Sven Huren Eriksson has realized his dream of taking charge of Liverpool Football Club. Just over two months ago, the former England manager revealed that he had terminal cancer and told Sky News that one of his final wishes was to be manager at Anfield. Well, today the club staged a tribute game, allowing Sven to walk out to a sellout crowd. Sky's Fraser Maud reports. The annual Legends charity match at Anfield raises thousands of pounds to help the community. This year, it's helping a certain 76-year-old Liverpool fan from Sweden fulfil a long-held ambition to manage the club. <laughs> Former England boss Sven Joran Eriksson announced in January that a pancreatic cancer prognosis had given him just a year to live. Talking to Sky's Neil Patterson, he made the admission that set the Anfield ball rolling. My father is still alive and he's still a Liverpool supporter. And um, 
I'm a Liverpool supporter as well. I always been. So I always wished to be the manager of Liverpool. And that will not happen, <laughs> for sure. But I'm still a Liverpool fan. So in steps the LFC Foundation and Jurgen Klopp to make it happen. You know, Sven's got no connection to the club as a manager or player, but the fact, I think, when the support was heard that he was a Liverpool fan, his dad, what well, is still a Liverpool fan, I think they, uh, you know, the, the, the movement started and um, I'm glad we could reach out and, and, and make it happen for him. Sven, you are invited from the bottom of all our hearts. You are invited to come here and you can have my office, we can everything, you can, be, um, we can lead a session if you want. That's all no problem. The supporters certainly appreciated the club's gesture. It is one of his last wishes, isn't it? I believe he always wanted to do, uh, manage Liverpool as well, which is great. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's a nice thing for him, I'd say. Yeah, excellent. I think that's fantastic. I absolutely love the fact that we gave him that opportunity. He's a nice guy, you know, but, and it's obviously a point in time in his life where he's probably looking back on a lot of things, and I think he'll look back on this, won't he? I think it's really kind of them, and uh, it's a good decision to let him have a go. Do you think he'll win? Defo. Gonzalez. In front of a 60,000 sellout crowd, the Liverpool legends came from two goals down to win the match 4 2 for Sven and his management team of Anfield heroes Rush, Aldridge, and Barnes. For Sven, it was an ambition achieved. Well, it's beautiful. It's uh, people raving, singing, and good win. And the, the, the crowd, incredible. Yeah, I was crying a little bit. Sadly, this is likely to be the final football farewell for the man who guided England to two World Cup quarter-finals. But what a wonderful and emotional way to bow out. Fraser Maud, Sky News, Anfield. OK, let's get the rest of the day's sport from Sky Sports News and Vishali. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people, more active. Live life with Vitality. One in five people are neurodivergent, meaning they have a difference in brain function. This one in five may be autistic, dyslexic, dyspraxic, or have ADHD, or another form of neurodiversity. I think being in sport as someone who's dyslexic and dyscalculic um, can be really challenging day to day, particularly with the numbers and distances and times and things. I think it's something that I've come to realise that the reasons why I do sport have very much to do with the fact that I am neurodiverse as well. Obviously, people will have heard probably of, of dyslexia. I mean, give me a sense of um, what it's like to, to, be, to be both dyslexic and dyscalculic. Dyslexia is words um, and literacy. I'll read a passage of text and I could read it three or four times but it might not fully go in. It's processing in my brain takes a little bit longer. Um, but for me, with dyscalculia, I feel like that affects me a lot more as an adult. Give me a sense of, of how that all comes, comes to play. What, what are the main challenges would you say in sport? I've been known to miss a couple of flights. Um, and yeah, I think when you see those things on the board where I've sort of read the flight time and that sort of moved and the gate number haven't aligned, just little things like that, little things like even telling the time on a non-digital clock or knowing how far a distance is in training um, affect me in my day-to-day -day still as an adult. Particularly on race day, we're usually given a call time for when we need to be ready and in the call room and you sort of have to work back from that time. So there's a lot of numbers and I usually write out a schedule for every uh, race day for what time I'm going to do everything just to take that process of thinking away from a really solid support system really helps. Um, my coach is definitely really on board with that. He'll be like, no, we're just going to do two laps a day or three laps or four laps. Um, um, and that really helps me cognitively to be able to just work out how far I've got to run. Give me a sense of, of how you feel being neurodivergent helps you within, within a sport setting. I think if you already have um, really good resilience, then you can bring that to sport. But I think there's little things like attention to detail and spatial awareness that are built into um, different new diversities. I know so many people that think they might be neurodivergent but have never had a diagnosis. But essentially that's why um, I've worked closely with um, British Dyslexic Association um, and being an ambassador to sort of push for their overall goal, which is to get 
specialist teaching assessors in every school. Mm. And give me a sense then of, of growing up, obviously, you know, growing up in Jamaica, what, what that was like and, and not knowing that you were dys dyslexic and dyscalculic. My experience of school in Jamaica was actually um, a really incredible way to learn and I feel like it did tap into that sort of creativeness and practicality that really um, I find supports my learning. It was when I came to the UK and just being sort of in a different and more structured environment where I started to notice that I was thinking a little bit differently um, and I was really lucky that my mum picked up on that quite quickly. How important is it for young people to have an interest at school that perhaps isn't English or maths if they're neurodivergent, I mean, of how important sport was to you at an early age. Knowing that I could be really good at something and um, enjoy that side of things was so important because it brought me a lot of confidence. Every neurodiversity is so different um, and helping other people to understand what works for you um, I think is really key for navigating different spaces. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. And that was Sky News at 10. Coming up, we'll take a first look at tomorrow's papers in the press preview. Tonight, we're joined by the chief foreign commentator for The Eye, Michael Day, and writer and broadcaster, Amy Nickel turner Well, among the stories, we'll be discussing this on the front of the Sunday Times. Their headline, Kate wrote every word to reassure the nation. We'll be right back. I'm Martha Kellner and I'm Sky's US correspondent based here in Los Angeles. It's turning everybody into, you know, a crazy violent drug addict. How are you feeling? I am angry. It is an anti-woman agenda. Two women say that you paid for their abortions. Are you a hypocrite, sir? Will your candidates win? I hope so. I think they will. I think they're great candidates. I gotta be realistic. My sister's dead. More than four weeks on, there's no murder weapon and no suspect. Are you going to catch this killer? We are doing everything we can. Glenn Maxwell has pleaded not guilty to all six charges against her. Mum, how are you feeling today? Jeffrey said, you answer to Ghislaine, you just don't cross her. I'm so excited. Severe nightmares of these people coming in and just taking me in the middle of the night. I've watched as whole towns were torn apart by natural disaster. I'm alive and I'm thankful for that, but there are a lot of people who aren't. It's not the winds people fear most here, it's the water. We take you to the heart of the stories which shape our world. Do you truly believe what you're saying? A lot of cases that I know are reported from Ukrainian missiles themselves. A ambassador, with respect, I think that's preposterous.
I've got some breaking news uh, to bring you. Islamic State has released footage from last night's attack in Moscow. On social media, Islamic State has again claimed responsibility for the attack in which more than 130 people were killed. And this comes um, shortly after the US National Security Council has stated that Islamic State does bear sole responsibility for that Moscow attack. Hello there, you're watching the press preview. A first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive in the next half hour. We'll see what's making the headlines with the chief foreign commentator for the eye, Michael Day, and the writer and broadcaster, Amy Nickel Turner. Welcome both. So let's see what is on some of those front pages. Well, reaction to the news that the Princess of Wales is undergoing cancer treatment leads most of the newspapers, starting with the Sunday Times, whose headline reads, Kate wrote, every word to reassure the nation. On the front of the Mail on Sunday, the message from the Princess of Wales this evening, thanking the public for their outpouring of love and well wishes. That's also on the front of the Daily Mirror. Their headline, thank you for your warmth and support. We are both so touched. And on the Sunday Express, a nation touched by Kate's courage. The Daily Telegraph leading with an image of the Prince and Princess of Wales together. Their headline, Prince's pride at courage of his wife. The Daily Star focusing on celebs groveling over insults to the princess, asking, now are they sorry? And The Sun on Sunday reports that Kate had an emotional lunch with the King earlier this week. Well, a different story from The Observer, their report on deadly tactics used by UK-funded French police against migrants crossing the channel in small boats. And a reminder that by scanning the QR code that you'll see on screen during the program, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's papers while you watch us. And we are joined tonight by Michael Day and Amy Nickel Turner. Thank you both uh, for being with us. And obviously, there's two main stories. There's a lot of coverage of the Moscow uh, attack as well, and we will look at it. But I guess we start with what is on all the front pages and, of course, the pictures, uh, the story um, about the Princess of Wales. Now, let's start with the Sunday Times. Um, Kate wrote every word to reassure the nation that um, every word, of course, of that of the video, that statement that she made um, uh, on, uh, on her social media channels. Amy, what do you think of the coverage and the story in general? I think hearing Kate speak, first of all, was, was fantastic because she's a bit of an enigma, isn't she? But she said it was incredibly important for her to speak this rather than write it. Mm. And she wants everyone to know that there was no input from any of her assistants, any of the staff at Buckingham Palace, um, and this came straight from her heart. She's just 42 years old and a mother of three, and I can't even begin to imagine the shock that the family felt. Mm. Um, every word of that statement, I mean, the words were subtle, but they certainly addressed every shred of controversy that we've heard over the past couple of months. And obviously, she's feeling incredibly vulnerable. I think William's feeling very protective of his wife. Um, but yeah, it was just hearing her voice, um, but she felt it would be more compassionate that way and sitting amongst the daffodils, which are the symbol of so many cancer charities, um, has really reassured everyone. But I think also brought, no one was expecting what, yeah. what she said. There was a million and one theories about what was going on with her, hmm. but not that one. Hmm. I didn't hear even a mention of, of that word, that terrifying word. Um, so while she's reassured the nation, it certainly was a massive surprise for everyone. And, and I mean, you mentioned that terrifying word, of course, cancer. And Michael, something that so many people across the country will be dealing with in, in their yeah. own personal lives. And it really, really was impactful yeah. uh, the way that she d delivered yeah. her. Uh, absolutely. I mean, regardless of what, are you th what you think about the royal family, this is a human story. This is a young woman with children who's had this shock diagnosis. And I think the, the video performance, it was quite dignified, it was graceful. And of course it helped because she's been in the news for the wrong reasons with the altered photo fiasco more recently. This was a natural performance and I think she's won plaudits for it. And as you say, cancer affects not just royal people, it affects, it affects so many people. Yeah. So, I mean, she's um, communic by being so open, I'm sure she's actually chimed 
with the, um, the things millions of other, or hundreds or thousands of people are going through as well. Yeah. And if we look at the front page of the mirror, I think we can pull it up now. Thank you for your warmth and support. We are both so touched. This is the statement um, released uh, just uh, about half an hour um, uh, ago. Um, and again, showing a, a united front. And I suppose instead of mentioning them, they were never going to, but all the speculation that there's been very much a united front and thanking the people that did show warmth and support. I mean, they did after, the, um, after her statement on Friday, but, I mean, there wasn't much warmth and support. I think that's fairly well acknowledged Maybe not on social now. media. Maybe on she social got a lot media. Of um, and, but I think, you know, people were rightly confused because of the lack of communication coming out of the palace. And I don't really think it was completely unjustified um, for people to have the, the, the um, confusion that, that they did. Um, However, another story mentioned is she, she's met up with this little girl who survived cancer, an ordinary little girl. And I hope that now two... I'm completely unprecedented scenario where two members, I mean, the most arguably most important members of our royal family, the king and the most popular mm. royal, now undergoing cancer treatment, just shines a light on UK's cancer treatment because we need to be striving for better. Yeah. I mean, we were discussing yeah, a lot of things it. things to talk yeah. about. I mean, yeah. you know... Our survival rates do lag behind other advanced nations. There are shortages of staff. I mean, recently I spoke to someone who is having to remortgage because she can't get the drugs for her partner the high, because of the, some of the Brexit EU barriers to drugs being imported. So there are a lot of things to talk about. And if this actually encourages that, or, or for the good reason. But interestingly, exactly. since yeah. King Charles went public with his diagnosis, yeah. there's been a surge in um, cancer referrals for private treatment. And, and, and just... not, not in the NHS, people having to go outside the NHS, because currently we're lagging 10 to 15 years And if you just look at the front page parts. of The Sun on Sunday, Kate had emotional lunch uh, with the King, and, of course, um, you know, both of them now um, you know, having been diagnosed with cancer. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a really heavy blow to the royal family, isn't it? The king, with the queen passing away, then the king, not so long after, the new king being diagnosed, and now another very, very senior royal family. And we've had other scandals. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a royal family that is reeling a bit at the moment. It's, you know, it's... I mean, that probably will induce a lot of sympathy for the royal family, but it's in quite a difficult situation. We've got to the stage where even Andrew is having to be let out, to be rolled out to do, you know, to do some of the, um, some of the work. It's, not, it's a difficult time for the royal family, But clearly. this is also um, an incredibly new found territory for the royal family to be being so open yeah. with yeah. their it health more, status. It looks, it looks more human, doesn't I it? I mean, Which... if you take back to when the Queen's father died. Nobody even knew what he died of I until guess after. different times, because if we look at the front the page died. of the Daily we Star... Still don't we don't know, know what the Queen what, died no. entirely, do we? But front page of the Daily Star is, now are they sorry? And they're really highlighting all the celebrities. There's just so many people that were wildly speculating yeah. as to why um, she had stepped back from public life, even though they had said that it was for health reasons. Um, so, I mean, interesting, and there's a picture of Blake Lively, and, I mean, I think... There were others that said worse, but it really yeah. does highlight how social media went yeah. crazy over this. Comment quickly, repent in le at leisure. I mean, that is social media, isn't it? But I don't, I don't blame... Buckingham Palace handled this quite badly until mm. Friday, and we were given such little information that people were left to run wild. But I think the um, situation now is that people are using TikTok to get as many followers and many likes by whatever means. We have to move on, but very quickly, do you think this will put an end to all speculation? Well, I think it's only going to make it worse. In terms, oh, oh, yeah. in terms of this story, yeah. I don't know. I've seen things today. Really? I think it's continuing. No, we, we are. We're a society of conspiracy theorists, unfortunately. Increasingly so. Yeah. Like sadly. I think TikTok. But, but now there's going to be calls, of, of course, to rein in TikTok, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of a political debate about how to limit these social media. Because we all have the choice to ignore a lot of stuff on yeah. social media as Switch well. Switch it off, yeah. good. Michael, and Amy, we're going to have to leave it there uh, for now. Um, and coming up, we're going to have coverage from the Sunday newspapers of the terrorist attack in Moscow, including from the Sunday Telegraph. Russia was warned not to use Moscow attack to intensify the Ukraine war.
uh, over two billion people have gained access to water over the last uh, couple of decades. It's just that there are still seven, over 700 million people who don't have access. That's about one in ten, as, as, you, as you just said. And the consequences of that are awful. So um, it's impossible to live a healthy life, kind of obvious. Um, girls are missing school during their periods if they don't have access to toilets, to good hygiene. Wider human development is impossible if we do not have this absolute basic, you know, blue thread that runs through our lives. There are even worries in hospitals, aren't there, of, you know, being able, not being able to keep control of superbugs if, you can't, if people can't wash their hands properly? You're quite right, you're quite right. It's, um, it's one of the most important things to do to combat anti the resistance, growing resistance of um, uh, anti um, uh, antibiotics no, no longer working. Um, I, I actually, there's, um, I visited uh, um, a health clinic in a district called Bla in the country of Mali in West Africa. Um, and I met women who were travelling two or three hours in a very rural area, so it was the only clinic for a long way around, to deliver their babies. It, it would tend to be more complex pregnancies, often, you know, caesarean and so on. And, um, well, we, we'd managed to install water, but in, before we had, it was 300 meter walk for doctors, for midwives to get water, um, and that just shouldn't be happening. It just shouldn't be happening in the in the 21st century. There is a danger. I said that progress had been made. It's true, but there's a danger we could move backwards if we're not careful. So you look at a country like Bangladesh, where you have rising sea levels and the um, the, the water sources that communities are using, and this is a lot of people, tens of millions of people. Um, that it's becoming um, uh, full of salt, which makes you very ill. Um, so that could affect, um, that, that will undermine uh, development that has occurred in that area if we're not careful. So yes, it's very, um, it's very important that we invest in making um, our water, supply of water resilient to climate change. And sanitation is very important too, because when you get flooding due to climate change, uh, if sanitation is not well, well managed, um, the, the water supply becomes contaminated, a, a risk for everybody. Welcome back. You're watching the Press Preview with me now. Chief Foreign Commentator for the Eye, Michael Day, and writer and broadcaster, Amy Nikel Turner. Thank you both so much for being with us. Okay, let's take a look at one of the other main stories in the papers, and that is the attack um, on Moscow by ISIS-K, or has been claimed by ISIS. But we can see this on the front page of the Sunday Telegraph. Russia warned not to use Moscow attack to intensify the Ukraine war. Uh, Michael, in a way, even though ISIS-K has claimed responsibility, and now we have the US also saying that they think ISIS are solely responsible, we have heard strange speculation coming out of Moscow, kind of insinuating that Ukraine is linked in some way. First of all, tell us what the story is in the Telegraph and how you think it might develop. Well, um, Britain is warning Putin not to use this as an excuse to intens intensify his war on Ukraine. I don't think that will make a lot of difference. I'm sure he will do. Um, he's won the, ele won the election. He's feeling confident. This is an embarrassing blow for him if it's the attack. We see, if it's an ISIS attack. So there's a very good chance he will use this to step up the aggression in Ukraine, send hundreds, perhaps 100 or 150,000 more untrained Russian fighters into Ukraine as cannon fodder in this dreadful war of his. That's, that's, a, that's a distinct possibility. Okay. But there is a lot of confusion about this. I mean, various rumours about what's really happened. I mean, as you say, the Americans 
but they've made it very, very clear that they think it's ISIS-K, this ISIS franchise from connected to Afghanistan. Um, but if, but there's, there's some, other, some other theories as well, because of course Russia in the past has used red, I mean, force flag attacks. I mean, Putin came to power on the back of some of these, probably, didn't he? When he was, you know, there were some apartment blocks blown up in, in Moscow in 99, 2000, which perhaps triggered the second Chechen war, which he got the credit for, and it boosted his rating. So there inevitably there are rumours, but all things considered, we, this probably is an Islamist terror attack. And Putin... I mean, they've claimed it, haven't they? The well, they've ISIS claimed have, it, they, but they kind yeah. of claim everything. I mean, ISIS will probably claim the, you know, starting yeah. the Punic Wars. They it, have but... released a video on their yeah. social media channels, I think, in the past hour or so, and even the US says it's ISIS. But what's interesting as well uh, is that the US say that they actually told Russia that yeah. there was mm. a, uh, an imminent threat. Now, Michael, I guess Putin doesn't really care that much about what is said in the West because yeah. he's he more liars, yeah. um, but he would care about what they think back home. Do you think this might have any impact? You know, the fact that the US did warn of this attack, but obviously wasn't I, heeded. I think there's a lot of there's been a lot of criticism on social media in Russia. I mean, people have pointed out, not unreasonably, if you stand, if you go outside a, a shop in the center of Moscow and pr with a pro the pro democracy banner, you'll be rugby tackled by security people in about 10 seconds. Yeah. Whereas this in this attack, this terrible attack at the concert on Friday night. I think there was, there's a National Guard barracks not far, two miles away, and it took them an hour or more to get there. You know? I mean, they could have walked there in that time. Well, really. I mean, speaking of walking, let's look at the front page of the Sunday Times, uh, because uh, it's on there as well. Murderous stroll of Moscow terrorists. So the killers walked calmly through the lobby of the venue, quote, as if they were out uh, for a stroll. I mean, Amy, what do you make of this? It's quite sort of... Shocking. It, yeah, I think um, everybody reading the news was was incredibly shocked. But um, I think immediately one of the first things was I saw Putin at, uh, trying to uh, link this to something going on in Kiev when you're and he is yet to say ISIS in any of his um, in his in his statements since. Um, and indeed, the US warnings were ignored. Um, they urged. Um, Moscow to not be having these types of events because the terror alert was so high yeah. and I'm sure that this will now be used to galvanise the war effort and it is it is timely because, as we've said, Putin's just had that... Um, can I say wonky election? You can <laughs> say rigged election, election. It was an right? Nonsense, um, yeah. And then uh, the attacks on Ukrainian infrastructure. So there needed to be something to push the war effort, I think, and I think in Russia this will be used in yeah. that way. It does show how complicated the world has got, though, hasn't it? Yeah. That ISIS, that obviously is an enemy of the West, and mm. then, you know, Russia and the West are having their issues, but actually attacking... Yeah. I mean, it just shows that the sort of, like, uh, I don't know, two sides... Right. Yeah, it's it such does. a complex situation. I think, I think in the past, I mean, I think there's been... They have, there's been is a history between Russia and ISIS. I think mm. during the Syrian civil war, Russia, for all the awful things it did in Syria, it did take out a lot of ISIS militants. Um, during that, so they've, they've, they have a history, and there's still a retaliation for what happened in Chechnya. Yeah, exactly. So. and I think there's one other thing I'd point I'd make. I mean, this also was a warning. I mean, we've forgotten about Islamist attacks, major ones, but we've had, of course, in Paris, in Manchester. They all seem to go for music halls, don't we? Mm. And given what's happening in the Middle East now, particularly in Gaza, I mean, I'm sure the authorities will have to be on red alert, won't they? But this is 133 people, isn't it, that yeah. have their lives taken yeah, away that's from them? Yeah, it's a horror. Okay. Um, we have a minute. Let's try and do this very quickly. The Observer front page revealed the deadly tactics used to keep migrants from our shores. Amy, what's the story about? So they've found footage of France essentially capsizing boats, slashing boats, um, letting people swim back to the shore in an effort to stop the boats getting across the channel. This type of thing apparently was um, Pretty Patel went to Greece and felt inspired um, by the techniques they used there, which have led to like 500 odd people dying in the water. Um, however, I think the French are under great pressure at the moment because they've been given so many hundreds of millions of pounds to try and stop the boats getting across the channel. Um, 
so by the UK, an extra 500 million last year. Um, but I think stories like this, we need to be careful to not just see a mass of people. And remember, these are pregnant women, these are children on these boats, and they're being pepper sprayed and capsized. And I think it's absolutely disgusting. Michael, 20 seconds. And against maritime law. Yeah. I, I mean, I think also it's, such, it, it's a huge it's political issue for the Tories. I mean, they, their stop the boats is their mantra. They've not stopped the boats. And they'll probably do anything to it. You know, I mean, the, the crossings are going to start rising in the late spring and summer, aren't but they? But they don't want to put any processing in France. So they no. could stop the boats. Well, but, but they'd like to, but they're not. But, I mean, this, this is going to go on and it's not going to get... There'll be more crossings in the summer. And um, so we've not heard the last of this. Amy Michael, we're going to have to leave it there uh, for now, but much more to come from you in the next hour. Thank you. Warm memories wherever you go. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. The UK is looking mostly fine tomorrow, while Ireland will turn wet. There will be uh, a mainly dry and sunny start with a patchy ground frost in the calmer north and west. But much of Britain will be windy. Expect a few showers near exposed northern and western coasts. The UK will stay dry with long sunny spells through the morning, although a few light showers may linger near northern and western coasts. And the raw wind will ease from the west. Ireland, meanwhile, will tend to cloud over with outbreaks of rain moving into western parts. It'll be a touch milder than today and lighter winds mean it should feel reasonably warm in the sunshine. The weather sponsored by Qatar Airways.